Giffen goods, as introduced in a previous lesson, certainly seem to be weird. They are characterized by an upward sloping demand curve, as they're drawn in the lower left part of the screen, so that when the price of a commodity goes up, you decide you want more of it. Your, the, uh, the demand for it goes up. The quantity demanded goes up. So it's natural to ask, does this exist in the real world? It does exist in theory. We already saw that. I already sketched indifference curves that generated a given good. But does it exist in the real world? The first traditional way to answer this question is yes. And to point to your point number one, potatoes in Ireland during the potato famine. So in the 19th century, there was a potato blight which struck the crop of crop of potatoes in Ireland. Irish peasants ate a lot of potatoes. It was the staple of their diet. But they also ate some other things, for example, meat. The idea is that you had this drastic drop in, in potato uh, production. Uh, people started to starve. They, so the, the price of potatoes went up because of the shortage because the uh, the supply curve is going down, but let's not talk about demand and supply right now. I think that's intuitive, though, that the price of potatoes would, would go up if, if, uh, if there's a shortage of potatoes. And then they responded by not being able to buy, not being able to spend any more money on meat. So the idea is they would spend now all their money on potatoes, whereas before they'd only spent part of their money on potatoes. And so the quantity demanded of potatoes went up. So the idea behind this example is the price of potatoes went up and the quantity demanded of potatoes went up. Your textbook has a rather good criticism of this explanation, which is if that were the case, you might think that the amount of potatoes sold in Ireland during this time had gone up, and actually it went down. So it's actually fairly unlikely that potatoes in Ireland during the during the potato famine were actually a given good. They probably weren't. By the way, just as a side comment, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the economics of famine because there's a Nobel Prize winner in economics named Amartya Sen who has done some very interesting work about the causes of famines. One usually thinks that famines are caused by not having enough food, food shortages. And Sen points out that in the modern world, that's probably not the case. What he says is that when you do have a crop failure, then it's the income of people who uh, raise, the, raise the food that has collapsed, and so they can't afford to buy food anymore. So therefore, it's a collapse of income, which is the proximate cause of famines. He furthermore points out that when you have countries that have a democratic government, or at least countries that have a free press, you really don't see famines. So in Ireland, in the mid-19th century, the government was controlled. Ireland was a British colony. There wasn't democracy. It was a colonial administration. And, he, and actually, there were food exports from Ireland during the famine. And the reason is because the landowners, who were mostly English, or at least came, uh, their ancestors came from England, uh, these wealthy landowners do what uh, owners of enterprises always do. They, they want to sell their crops. And since the peasants in Ireland didn't have much money anymore, they weren't a good market. So the crops were exported from Ireland to overseas to customers who could afford to pay money for the crops. So in that sense, there wasn't a food shortage in Ireland uh, during the famine. Uh, it, was a, it was a collapse in income. Sen also uh, actually lived through the Bengal famine of 1943, where, again, you had a colonial government. Actually, it was the British, again, being uh, the colonial power. And uh, m many, many people died in this famine in India, and uh, Sen pointed out that there was still food available, but the income of these people had collapsed. In fact, at that time, there was an inflation, 
and the inflation benefited some people but uh, hurt other people and the the people that it hurt had a collapse in their real income and couldn't afford to buy food anymore another example of a of a more recent famine was the the large famine in China in the 1960s connected with Chairman Mao's Great Leap Forward. So in all these cases you had a non-democratic system and Sen's point is that once you have democracy and a free press then mere food shortages aren't enough to cause famines and public opinion and governments act in a way to alleviate the food shortage before it gets to that point. So if potatoes in Ireland during the potato famine were not a given good. How about point number two, financial instruments such as stocks? Sometimes people think, well, if the price of a share of stock goes up, then the quantity that you demand of it might go up because you think that's a pattern. It's called momentum in the investing uh, literature. And you think the price is going to keep on going up, and so you want to buy some now in order to take advantage in, uh, of, the, of the price increase. The thing is that the demand curves that we're talking about are demand curves about commodities that affect utility. Shares of stock are a financial instruments. They are not arguments of the utility function. You, get, you don't get utility from a share of stock or a bond or a dollar bill for that matter. You get utility only from actual things that you can consume. So, uh, uh, furthermore, in our theory, we don't have time. At the end of the semester, we'll talk a little bit about dynamic economics, but we're not talking about dynamic economics right now. So there is no time, and therefore there's no saving, there's no investing. So the framework in which we're working has nothing to do with financial instruments like stocks. So that's not an example of a give a good. How about consumer goods that have high prestige and low prestige categories, such as regular genes and designer genes? This is my third point on the screen. The idea being that if the price of a gene goes up, so it's a designer gene, so it's more expensive, then people will decide they, they want to buy it more. It's a more attractive item. Well, X here has to be just one kind of commodity. So if there's a difference between regular genes and designer genes, then those are two different commodities. Now, I realize they may not be two different physical commodities. Physically, the genes, the regular genes and designer genes might be actually the same. But the fact that one of them has a label saying it's a designer gene makes people value it differently from the one that doesn't have such a label. So its social importance is different than the social importance of a regular gene. And to the extent that there are consumers that care about that, and there are, then an economist would say that these are different commodities, even though physically they're the same. Because economists aren't interested in merely the physical aspects of a commodity, but all the aspects of the commodity, including their sociological, psychological, cultural aspects. So those would be two different commodities. And therefore, the right way to ask this question is if you had, if you were looking at one pair of designer genes, would you really want it more if its price went up? And I think the answer to that question is no. If, if, uh, if it's exactly the same commodity, then when its price went up, I don't think you want it as much. The fourth thing that I have on this slide will strike you as being pretty strange say food that's tasty but high effort for rats. I'm not talking here about people. Well, there are, is a small group of economists that do experiments, and among experimental economists, there are some that actually use laboratory animals, rats in particular. And there was economic research that was done actually by a former colleague of mine at Texas A&M, Ray Pitalio, which used rats in a laboratory setting to see whether one kind of food for rats would be a gift and good. I have put on the web, on the website, a PDF file which contains a summary of that research and I'd like you to to read that. 